Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another part of our diabetes series. Today, we'll be talking about coping with diabetes. My name is Dr. Maria Elena Pena. I am the Director of Endocrine Services here at Forest Hills um, Mount Sinai Doctors. I'm also the medical director for the Diabetes Health Alliance for the entire health system. And joining me today will be our dietitian, Maria Fraga. Hi everyone, my name is Maria Fraga. I work here at Mount Sinai Forest Hills with Dr. Pena. And we will be talking today about coping with diabetes along with uh, some dietary education uh, that I will be focusing on. Today we wanna to go like, how can we um, deal with diabetes? How can we cope with it? How can we improve outcomes? And one of the things I tell my patients is to identify a go-to group support. Uh, even something like this, even having a family member who's on board with you, a, a, a friend, a neighbor, who when you go out, for example, you want to eat, they kind of encourage you to make the right food choices. Because I tell patients, let's say, let's say you had a patient, someone, unfortunately, with addiction um, illness, a person who is addicted to alcohol or drugs, would you walk into a bar with this person to, to, to increase the temptation? No, you try to avoid those activities. It's almost the same thing with, with eating. You want to have a group that will say, you know what, but yes, let's share this entree. Yes, let's go for the healthier option. So getting that support really, really helps outcomes. Um, so even, even at night, making healthy meals that everyone participates, because it's not easy to cook for your child, your partner, yourself, whatever it may be. So you want to all be on the same page. That's the ideal. You also, and you can always discuss with your medical team, with a group of diabetic educators, for example, with your doctor, we can give you tips and advice, or at least direct you to resources that can help you, um, such as something like this. This can help you sharing this information with your friends and family, can really help you um, get the support you need in order to be uh, more compliant with healthy eating. The other thing is moving your body. I tell my patients, it's not so much exercising, it's a way of life. It's physical activity. I feel that physical activity Activity is very different from exercising. Exercising is more of this regimen that sometimes we don't have time for. But if you're a set of, in, of increasing physical activity where you say, I will park a little bit farther, assuming it's safe to park farther, I'll park a little bit farther so I can walk. I'll take the stairs instead of the elevator. I'll stretch it, um, uh, every time that I'm sitting. Let's say you're, many people have sedentary lifestyles or they're sitting at a desk. You can say, look, every hour I'll put a timer that means I have to stretch or I have to you know tippy toe or I need to plank just different ways of incorporating physical activity into your lifestyle um something even better you can say okay after dinner I'll go for a walk with the family or something fun like dancing or yoga anything that you feel is sustainable and that's going to be a part of your lifestyle that's what we're striving for and uh, also positivity there is a lot to be said about having a positive attitude. Unfortunately, it appears that doctors are not and, and clinicians are not on board with the whole positive attitude, uh, you know, uh, law of attraction, for example, all these things I do believe prayer, whatever it is, meditation, I believe that all of these things definitely help outcomes, it puts you in that right mindset, if you put your mind in the right direction, your body will follow through your actions will follow through. So I really think that having a positive attitude and I have seen it in clinical, I don't have the data, or the statistics, I have seen it with my patients every day when I tell them, hey, you have diabetes, your A1C is elevated, but we can change this and they're like, yes, on board with it, they have better outcomes. Whereas the other person, when I tell them and they're in shock, um, that person tends to do, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So really having a positive attitude can help. So the point is that yes, diabetes has a lot of complications, but unlike other health um, issues, this is one that you have a lot of control over. So in this slide, so how does physical activity, movement, uh, overall improve diet, diabetes? So we talked about the mental aspect of it. We talked about how you release endorphins, serotonin, and all that helps you. But there's also an actual physical change that occurs when you exercise. So yes, people can lose weight with diet, with exercising. It helps you burn fat. It's the best way of burning fat, right? Because it really makes you tap into those fat stores um, in your liver, for example, that's um, in your heart, because sometimes fat attaches to your liver, it attaches to your heart, it attaches to other organs. So that, that um, helps burn that fat, but also it helps with what's called the insulin resistance, right? That's part of diabetes. So diabetes is for type two specifically, it's a problem with 
the insulin receptors no longer working. So eventually you're producing insulin, just not working the right way. And then eventually you're not producing enough insulin. So there's two processes that are going on. So what that, um, exercise does is that it helps these receptors that are mostly located in obviously your organs, but also in your mind muscle mass, it helps your receptors work better so that the insulin works more effectively. So it also makes, think of this as many people think is one or the other. I believe in complementary medicine where it's, let's do both. Let's try to make the medicine that you're already taking work more effectively. Let's decrease the need to increase medication so that we can decrease the side effects of these medicines by adding your part with diet and with exercise. So exercise in itself definitely helps decrease uh, this insulin resistance and makes your natural insulin work better. and also makes the insulin the medicines are making you produce work better. So again, it's a great way of controlling your weight. Um, it actually helps control your hunger. It helps with body pains. Many people, you know, your joints, everything aches because you're so stiff. If you stretch, if you walk, these pains get better and also your glucose levels get better. So like I said, it's hard in general, because I see both diabetes patients and patients with suffering from obesity and overweight, but even more so for a diabetic, if we can get you into the mindset of, you know what, part of my regimen, let's say after dinner is that I need to walk so I can burn off what I ate so that that, that I can digest better and so that I can bring down my, my glucose levels naturally, that's something that you can do. Something as simple as a 25 to 30 minute walk. But let's say now you can't do 25 minutes, even a 10 minute walk, even just walking around your block, especially now that the weather's still nice, is something that you can um, try to incorporate in your lifestyle. So how can I get started with an exercise plan? So like we said, talk to your doctor, talk to your diabetes care team, talk to your diabetic educator and see, you know, I want to start a change. What do you recommend? I personally recommend, and Maria and our team, <clears throat> we're trained to recommend small baby steps. I think that small baby steps goes a much a longer way than making a drastic a change. And then you feel you can't achieve and then you give up. So I think that's getting attainable goals. Um, we say, choose your activity. So something that you enjoy, that's always been what we tell patients. Um, you know, like I said, walking, swimming, if it's dancing, some people love Zumba, whatever it may be, make it fun, make it sustainable. Um, for people, you know, when you have your kids, for example, you want to incorporate physical physical activity for the entire family. Why not do just a dancing thing in between commercials? Hey, let's all stand up. Let's stretch. Let's dance for five minutes. I remember my mom used to do that on weekends. She used to make us all uh, uh, dance. So that's a great way of, of incorporating physical activity. And then, um, so here it comes, you know, about checking your blood sugars. The older medications for diabetes tended to cause more hypoglycemia or low sugar attacks. The more modern medications actually are better because they just work when you eat. So I'm actually not so concerned about a drop, like a, a dangerous drop in your, in your glucose level, unless you're on, if you're on insulin or if you're on something called a sulfonylurea, such as glipizide, glimepiride, or short acting metaglinide, something like, um, Brandon, which is known as repaglinide, for example. So if, if you're on those medicines, then yes, you do run a risk of having a drop in your sugar. So if you're on insulin or one of these oral pills called a glimepiride or glipizide, for example, or prandin, then yes, you can have a drop in your sugar. But if you're on the um, other medicines, such as those once a week injectables, um, under the name, for example, of, let's say Trulicity or or the daily one like Victoz, I'm just giving you some names, or the newer one called Rebelsis, that doesn't cause a low sugar attack. And neither do these other um, class of medicines, such as the SGLT2 inhibitors, such as um, Girardis, Forsiga, and Vocaminas, Deglatio, and also at Metformin. So those are better in the sense that they do not cause hypoglycemia. So you don't, do not have to have that fear that, oh, my sugar is going to drop. Because many times that holds people back from exercising. And if you find yourself that you want to adopt a new lifestyle change and you want to start exercising on a day-to-day -day basis and you are on insulin and you are dropping, let your doctor know so you could have a new, that doesn't, many times people have this idea, well, my sugar is dropping, I need to eat a snack. No, why not consider decreasing it on the insulin? That's the that's the mindset that we want for our kid for for in general for the cure for diabetes. So we want to um you know wearing a medical identification tag. I always tell people just in case try to wear a medical bracelet. You never know, especially for my patients who are insulin dependent. We want to wear a bracelet because let's say God forbid uh, the what we don't want happens, which is maybe you pass out 
uh, from a low sugar attack, let's say, or you, you reverse a very bad hyperglycemic event that causes you to pass out. You want whoever is trying to give you help to know what to do. And having a medical identification tag for diabetes or for any other chronic uh, um, illness is very helpful. Um, caring for your feet, that's a big one. So what's the fear that many people have with diabetes? Oh, that I might lose my toes, I might lose my foot. Um, because sometimes with uncontrolled diabetes, you get numbness in your feet and you can't feel it when there's a little cut. So the cuts is brewing, getting infected. You don't feel the pain. And then all of a sudden, by the time you see it, it's too late. So always look at your feet, look in between your toes and wear shoes that are meant for diabetics that <clears throat> don't give you a lot of friction. They're not too tight because all those things can create sores and blisters. You know, drinking water is great. I think of it as a way of flushing out the toxins from your system, keeping your sugar levels low. Um, and you need to hydrate, hydrate. So that's very, very important. And also don't push yourself too much. If you're, you're a person who has not uh, been used to exercising, do it gradually. You don't want to do something all of a sudden and hurt yourself. And uh, let me see. So I'll turn this over now to Maria Frog, our dietitian. She'll go over, um, you know, how can we um, start changing the diet? So she'll be giving you some tips. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Pena, for all that wonderful information. And so what I'm going to focus in on in this webinar is where do we get started with healthy eating and meal planning? And so typically when I see a patient, I like to take a diet recall to kind of understand what you're drinking, what you're eating, what are your habits during the day? Um, are you having snacks? What are, kind of snacks are you ha uh, choosing or carrying? What are your beverages? What do you drink when you're thirsty? Are you adding sugar to coffee and tea? Um, are you making meals ahead of time? Are you meal prepping? Are you cooking for additional meals? Um, do you have certain restaurants do you dine out during the day when you're at work? Do you have food at your work desk? Um, these are all habits that people um, kind of typically, uh, you know, adhere by. And habits are, 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 are things that we do day after day. So what we're doing with, with, uh, with our patients is when we come together with them is how can I bring forward to you uh, ways to start a, a new goal? Or what can we do together to work towards your goal? Which basically is what we do together with our patients. I mean, we, we're here to manage your care and to make you uh, the center of the team. Uh, we want to make sure we're guiding you and supporting you. Um, and it's important to be very, very realistic with goals that we set forward. Um, I know a lot of patients want a lot very fast, but it's more realistic if we work slow and build on the goals um, from visit to visit from month to month. For many of you, you have seen this picture before. It's the plate. It's how we should try to um, choose our foods in uh, looking at our plate in three parts. Uh, I always think of filling half of the plate first with your favorite vegetables or a big salad. You know, don't measure vegetables. Go for two and three and four servings of veggies. There's so many wonderful ways to make your vegetables tasty using herbs and spices, different cooking techniques. There's uh, air fryers now. There's grilling and roasting. Um, so there's a lot of great things you can add to your vegetables, herbs, and seasonings. Um, and then one fourth of your plate should be your lean protein, your chicken, your fish, your, your um, lean, lean meats. And the carbs should only occupy a fourth of your plate. That, those, that's the food group that will definitely impact your blood sugar and your diabetes values. Um, and so for people who are managing diabetes, you know, it's very effective to test your blood sugars two hours after eating so that you more or less know um, the carbs you've chosen to eat and how they're impacting your postprandial blood sugars. And we say that American diabetes is gold for two hours after eating is to have a blood sugar of 180 or less. That would be ideal. Um, but again, these, these numbers are set with your, your uh, doctor, your endocrinologist, and so it, they don't apply to everyone, but typically is 180 or less. Le next slide. Which foods can I eat? And that's a question that we are, you know, asked all the time when patients come to visit us. Please tell me what I can eat. Tell me what I should not eat. Do you have a list I could follow? I mean, I wish it could be that easy, but we all come from different backgrounds and cultures. And there's one thing that we don't want to stop eating is the foods that we were raised eating. So think of like choosing fruits and vegetables, preferably fresh fruit, nothing canned, Nothing like dry fruit tends to be smaller in volume, 
very high in sugar. Think of reading your food labels, looking for whole grains, foods that are high in fiber, um, comparing your labels in the market. It takes a little time to really learn like what is a better choice? There's so many, so much misconception with, with food labels. So, you know, going to the supermarket and taking a little time on the shelf to pick your, your you know, the best cereal, which bread should I purchase? Um, low fat dairy. Um, there's also other choices of, um, of dairy, such as not dairy, dairy, but like soy milk and almond milk tends to be lower in carbs and the lean proteins again like i mentioned you know it could be beans it could be fish it could be uh poultry lean beef and pork and the healthy oils obviously for heart health would be like avocado extra virgin olive oil you can buy sprays and that would also limit the amount of oil that it's going into your cooking or into your pan um so you know definitely that's the foundation of what can i eat but definitely reading your food labels and trying to managing your, your calories in with exercise. Um, if you have a sedentary lifestyle, then you know you need to be more careful with what you're eating because you're not burning those calories. And obviously you're not gonna see the scale shift as quickly as you would like. So really being you know very conscious about the calories you're consuming, the choices of food you're choosing. Um, you can't compare uh, you know, uh, a batch of French fries to an apple. They're both carbs, but you're getting a different value nutritionally with an apple than you would get with French fries. Um, these are just superfoods, foods that we kind of like put out in one slide, just for all our views to really see um, the Greek yogurt, the nuts, preferably buy them unsalted. Obviously, salt is very addictive. So if you buy something salty, you're going to crave more of it. And then you're going to be thirsty. And then, you know, so basically for our patients who, who are on diuretics or are being more cautious with hypertension or blood pressure, choose things that are lightly salted or unsalted, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables. I would go with all natural peanut butter, you know, the low fat peanut butter tends to have more sugar. So again, read your food labels. Um, and here you have a picture of the dark chocolate, which sometimes is thought of like the bad thing to stay away from. But again, if you have dark chocolate or your favorite dessert and you, and you can possibly eat it in small portions and really savor it when you're having it, take time to really like smell it and, and, and take the moment to really um, consume it in, in a mindful way. We can also have the idea of displacement, right? When you fill up your plate, like you show with the plate method of more veggies, and more lean proteins, you naturally end up doing more portion control with carbs. Um, so that's, some, that's also another tip. We kind of ensure that every meal has at least some of that veg vegetables, that fiber that really helps with portion control. We don't have to think about it so much. And I want to, you know, now that you're talking about this, Dr. Pena, I remember a study where they had um, they had utilized uh, patients where if they started their their meal with non-starchy foods like vegetables and salad mm -hmm. um they use it they would have better two hour postprandial blood sugars because Absolutely. that sometimes led them to eat less carbs and also the fiber at the start of the meal helped manage their blood sugars and the way the blood sugar spiked Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, that definitely helps because sometimes portion control is not that easy, especially if you're feeling hungry, but even just changing the order of how you're doing things, like Maria mm -hmm. said, having maybe a salad right before you go for dinner, that can help as well. Yes. And the next slide is just ways of estimating portions. Again, I go back to measuring, take the measuring cups and uh, your tools out of your pantry and try to measure your cereal. I mean, I know that patients sometimes just, you know, eat foods without thinking about the portion that they're consuming and they'll come in to see us and, oh, they have this great cereal, but they may not be eating a cup of it, it might be two cups. And then they're having like regular milk and fruit and they're adding granola. A lot of other things are being added. So measuring everything you eat, especially your carbs, are, is going to help you definitely better your, your the management of your blood sugars. So um, avoid the sugar shock. Just really re read your food labels um, just to identify which foods you should really not purchase and which foods are better for you to, you know, consider just having a staple at home. Um, and the next slide is, you know, how to make your favorite beverage or beverages you're buying at your favorite coffee shops. You know, really, again, avoiding all the added sugars that could be easily found in um, iced coffees and these fancy drinks that we purchase and spend lots of money on buying. 
Um, and then the next slide is basically alcohol. Um, you know, alcohol is a fat and it has calories and it can impact your blood sugar and mask hypoglycemia. So drinking alcohol, alcohol with diabetes is something to be cautious with. And thank you so much for your uh, attending our webinar today. Dr. Pena and I are very happy to be able to share with you um, what we do every day here in our office.